Hi, everybody. Um, we have, oh, we're right on time. Um, I Let me see. Uh, so today um, we have the last uh, in the webinar, homeowner webinar series. Um, my name is Jen Marvin, um, and uh, I am very happy that you've been able to join me all year uh, for this um, webinar series. Uh, we are going to continue it next year. Um, and uh, before we get started, um, I'd like to take a poll uh, of um, people. Uh, well, you can read the poll. Uh, I'd like to know if you would rather sign up for these webinars all at once or keep it as it is where you sign up one at a time. So as you are um, listening to me talk about uh, you know, this webinar, um, if you could answer that um, poll question, that would be great. Um, today we have uh, Tom Wickman speaking about bulbs for Florida. Um, let's see, and uh, uh, this, uh, this, like I said, this will be our last um, webinar for the year. We won't have one in December, uh, but I've been busy setting up uh, next year's webinars. And uh, so far we have um, Dr. Michael Kane will be telling us um, his story of studying the ghost orchid. Um, which I'm I'm really excited about. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge and a great speaker. Uh, we've got the ten top ten house plants, uh, turf alternatives, um, and uh, botanical journaling, just for a few of the subjects. Um, and as my calendar fills out, we'll send out a, a notice of what uh, what to expect for next year. And um, it will still be on the same day and time uh, as these, the third Tuesday of every month at 11 o'clock. Uh, so um, as you're filling that out, let me let you know that your microphones are muted. And if you have questions, please type them into the chat box uh, during the presentation. Um, stick around to the end so that uh, you can take the survey and um, give me some ideas, if you would, about uh, what else you'd like to see for next year. Um, these, the survey really helps me uh, figure out, you know, what, what we're doing right and uh, what things you all like to um, hear about. Uh, so let's see, what, what was, Becky, can you um, tell us the uh, result of the poll? Oh, there it is. So 59 want to sign up for the series all 59% all at once. Okay, so we'll talk about it and see, um, you know, see what uh, what we'll do. And um, we will definitely send out a notice if anything changes and once we get the schedule lined up. So um, for right now, I'd like to introduce Tom Wickman, um, my friend from next door uh, in the office. And um, he's gonna be speaking about bulbs for Florida. Um, Tom, if you would uh, introduce yourself and um, take it away. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, my name is Tom Wickman. I'm the Assistant Director for the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and the Statewide Coordinator for the Green Industries Best Management Practices Program. <sighs> That's a big, uh, a lot to say, but it's all what it, uh, the GIBMP program is uh, basically I work with landscape professionals, teaching them how to maintain landscapes while still protecting the environment. It all fits with that Florida friendly landscaping message. Um, and I'm so excited today, I get to uh, talk to you about bulbs for Florida. You know, there's people, most of the people in Florida have come from somewhere else. And, you know, when you think of bulbs, what are you thinking about? You're kind of thinking about tulips and daffodils and hyacinths, um, not so much in Florida. Um, let's let's think about bulbs that are great for the South. And there's so many that we could choose from. So we're going to go through a, a litany of those uh, today. So some of the ones that some of my favorites, that's kind of the beauty of getting to do a, a presentation like this is I get to, to bias you a little bit about uh, what what are my favorites. And so hopefully um, I'll be able to share some of those with you uh, before we get started you know, with the different bulbs that we could plant. We'll talk a little bit about, let's see if I can maybe get my, pre there we go. Talk about the, the different structures that we're talking about. You know, when we talk about bulbs, we're gonna talk about a lot of different 
structures. There are true bulbs, and true bulbs are those with compressed stems, um, and they've got a growing point as well. Those are things like tulips and narcissus and amaryllis are all examples of true bulbs. And some of the other things we call bulbs may be corms. Um, corms have a stem tissue with a terminal bud, and then they've got auxiliary buds around them. An example might be gladiolus. And then we have tubers. Tubers are thickened underground stems that have many bulbs. Caladium would be an example of a tuber. And then we have rhizomes. And rhizomes are thickened horizontal stems that are at the soil surface or, or just below. And things like canna and calla lilies are rhizomes. And uh, gingers would be rhizomes as well. So these are all examples. Um, but whether it's a bulb, whether it's a corm, a tuber, a rhizome, we're going to call it a bulb today. So um, our talk is kind of uh, encompassing all of those different structures. Now, when you're looking for a place to plant your bulbs, it's very dependent upon which, uh, which plant you're choosing. Some of them like full sun. Some of them prefer shade. Some of them can tolerate a, a little mix of of both. And so really it's a, a matter of choosing that right plant for the right place. With Florida Friendly Landscaping, we love to teach right plant, right place. And it's more than just light. It's into soil and it's, um, it's you know, everything that goes into that and including where we are uh, within the country and making sure we're planting plants that will thrive and do well. Um, so choose your site you know, specifically to whatever plant that you're planting. And ideally, you know, most of our soils here in Florida are very sandy. They don't have a lot of organic matter. Most of our bulbous plants would would prefer having a little bit or, uh, more organic matter. So for best results, I would recommend if you can work in some organic matter, whether that's um, compost or... Um, you know, there's mushroom compost, there's um, composted cow manure, there's, you know, peat products, any of these type things, the more organic matter you can work in, probably the better you're going to uh, see your plants do. And, and probably the less you'll have to water and fertilize as well, because uh, that organic matter will hold on to some of those things. So if you can prepare that entire bed, you'll probably see the best results. And then we've got to obviously take care of watering these, these bulbs from time to time. We'll fertilize them. I like to use, again, it depends on which um, bulbs I use. I don't fertilize much in my landscape. I fertilize very little. I have an older landscape. I've been uh, in my home for 21 and a half years. Um, when I moved in, much of the soil there was like sugar sand, almost no organic matter. But with you know, over 20 years of mulching with lots of leaves and, and other mulch products. Now we're seeing, you know, a lot more organic matter. And um, I don't do a lot of fertilizing uh, in my landscape. It, uh, I shouldn't tell you this, but I, I only fertilize. Most of the plants probably get fertilized once every uh, three or four years. Um, and you know what? They do pretty well. Now, if something's struggling, uh, I may address that. If I see nutrient deficiencies, I may you know, specifically address that, but I don't do a lot of fertilizing. I do mulch, um, and I use mostly uh, the leaves that fall from my oak trees. I have a lot of oak trees on my property, and so I use a lot of that leaf mulch. And because I have such large beds, um, it's a lot less expensive, but any Florida friendly mulch could work out really well. And those organic mulches as they break down will again add to that organic matter. And most of our plants are going to really benefit from deadheading. Uh, unless you're specifically looking at something that you want to set seed to, uh, to continue to uh, increase the number of plants that you have in that area, Deadheading is, is something that removing the old blooms before they set seed so that plant isn't wasting energy in trying to produce seed. Uh, you're looking for more and more flowers. And in most cases, that's what we're looking to do. Pest control, I very much uh, like to 
teach people about integrated pest management or IPM. IPM can involve pesticides, but that's the very last straw. Certainly, we'd like to think about taking care of uh, number one, we're going to scout our landscape on a frequent basis, and so we're going to we're going to look and really examine that landscape. And you know, it, it you turn leaves over, and if you find look at leaves that have holes in them, see if you can't figure out is the pest there that's making those holes. Um, you know, keep the area clean, keep it as weed free as possible, because sometimes those weeds are going to uh, house various pests that, that can move on to your plants. And you know, if if you do have to use a pesticide, do make sure that you're spot treating as opposed to blanket spraying um, and or, or spraying on a schedule. We want to treat pests when they're there. Um, uh, and actually, we talk about managing pests rather than controlling pests because some pests are can be okay as long as they're not doing a lot of damage. And a lot of times, the beneficials will come in and take care of a lot of those pest problems, so you won't have to do any management techniques with them. Um, there are certain pests, especially on lilies, that can be real problem. That's one that's uh, the lubber grasshoppers. Um, if you're growing any lilies, you've probably dealt with the lubber grasshopper. Those are the grasshoppers that get three or four inches. They're quite colorful with colors of yellow and they've got pink wings. Um, when they're little, when they first hatch out, they're black with a yellow or orange stripe, um, and they'll be all massed together. And very soon they start moving out, chomping your plants, and um, they can do a lot of damage. So um, my wife is really diligent at uh, uh, going out on lubber patrol and taking care of them. But that is one pest that can really affect uh, you you know, a lot of lilies, um, a wide range of plants they can chew down, but I've had them do a lot of damage in my landscape. Other than that, I don't have a whole lot of pest problems on really any of my other bulb uh, crops. It's that big one, that lubber grasshopper that uh, is one that I have to, to take care of. And then I get asked a lot of times, where do I buy my bulbs? Where should you buy them? Well, wherever you can find them. Um, you know, some, sometimes they're, uh, it's really easy to find them at uh, the various plant shows or plant fairs. Um, you might find a lot of things there. Um, I do buy from mail order. Um, you know, I, my wife hides the credit card every time the Plant Delights catalog comes out. So I, I do buy from there. There's Brent and Becky's bulbs. There's Southern bulbs. These are all some of the nurseries that are online and ship mail order. Um, but don't forget about, you know, our local garden centers have, you know, a lot of uh, great opportunities. Even the big box stores, you'll find some really cool stuff from time to time to add to your collection. And then there's our societies. Um, and uh, the, it's a great way to to build up your collection just by meeting folks. And a lot of times they're going to share uh, some of their collections with you. So a lot of ways to increase your collection, a lot of ways to find some of these. And a lot of our bulbous plants are some of those pass along plants that, you know, have been, people have been growing for decades. And um, a lot of times people are very willing to share. So let's look at some of these uh, bulbous type plants and some may be more familiar than others to you. And Hopefully, um, I'll, I'll show you some new ones, some, some ones that uh, you're going to really uh, covet. Um, one of these is the Achimenes. Achimenes are an African violet relative, so they're a gisnariad. Uh, they do have a kind of a fuzzy leaf, and they put out these beautiful blooms that, oh, are maybe about an inch, inch and a half across at most. Um, they come in a wide range of colors from purples to pinks to white. Um, and they they work really well in hanging baskets or containers. Um, they do go dormant in the wintertime. So it's really important that you understand that, you know, that they won't be there during the wintertime. And regrettably, I have thrown away um, by accident um, dormant pots of Achimenes bulbs in the past. And um, that's, that's uh, I've kicked myself for doing that. But 
Um, know that they're they're a great crop, beautiful, beautifully colorful. Um, don't take up a lot of space. Don't take a lot of care. But uh, it's it's a fun one. Nice African violet relative. How about the African lily or agapanthus? Uh, agapanthus are one that's used a lot as a ground cover. It's a great ground cover for um, most of the state of Florida. Um, and they come in, traditionally, they were in these uh, umbels of, of blue flowers. Uh, there's also white forms. And now we're seeing all different combinations. We're seeing some, like you see on that image on the left, um, that's one called Queen Mum that I have in my landscape that you know, just performs so well. And it's got that that mix of the, the uh, bluish purple and the white. Um, there's a lot of different cultivars coming out. And you see like the uh, amethyst storm on the, the right. Um, again, that's in my landscape and it's so colorful. Um, so, uh, you know, agapanthus are an old timey plant. They make a great ground cover. They've got strappy foliage. Um, they probably do best where they get uh, at least a half a day's sun so that they flower well. Um, ideally, probably morning sun, maybe protected from the hottest afternoon sun, but I've, I've seen them do well in full sun and, you know, they don't flower as well uh, in, in more shade. But uh, they make a great cut flower as well. They, those blooms can last for uh, well over a week, sometimes up to two weeks uh, cut in a vase. So, you know, it's a really good one for you to add to your landscape, especially if you're into uh, cut flowers. How about amaryllis? Amaryllis are, are some of those plants that really kind of, they, they come up and they've got these giant blooms and they really make a statement. And, um, you know, they come in a wide range of colors, different size flowers, different uh, size plants as well. Some are bigger than others. Um, and you know, it's, they can really make an impact, makes a great gift plant as well. Um, a lot of our amaryllis, there are garden uh, varieties that do better uh, planted out in the garden. And then there's a lot of our, our hybrids um, that uh, come from Europe. And some of those, you know, probably are a little easier in containers. Um, one of the uh, problems with amaryllis in our sandy soils uh, planted in the ground is they, they do tend to sink from uh, just from time to time. And, you know, the, in our sandy soils, they'll, they'll tend to settle down. And when, if they get too deep, then they won't flower well. They'll just come up with strappy foliage. And when someone asks me, you know, well, my amaryllis never flower. Um, you know, first question is, tell me about the sunlight. Are they in enough sun? Um, they may or may not be if that could be the problem, or it could be that they've just sunk too deep and may need to be lifted. Um, one gentleman from the uh, Amaryllis Society here in Florida, um, he talked, uh, he's got a little trick that he'll actually put a ceramic tile. Well, just get a, a indistinct four by four piece of ceramic tile and he sets that underneath his Amaryllis so that they can't settle down and sink uh, in the soil. So um, that's that's a trick that he uses. I haven't, I've never tried that, but um, I keep most of mine in containers. I do have some garden varieties that I do have planted um, in, in the ground, uh, and they do quite well. And then there's the Amazon lily, the Eucharist lily. I've been growing Eucharis for my entire gardening career for over 50 years. And, you know, it's one of these, they have these white, wonderfully fragrant blooms, kind of smell lemony, kind of have that, a little bit of that hint of citrus, um, make a great uh, container plant. The, the image you see on the right, um, that's uh, just a plant that's in a big container and I do bring it in in the winter time so it doesn't freeze. I know here in Gainesville, a lot of people will plant them in the ground and they'll go dormant in the winter time um, and then come back in the spring. Um, I keep mine in a container and I do bring that in uh, whenever we have freezing weather. Um, a lot of times we tend to see them bloom heaviest kind of in that that winter time and early spring. So um, it's it's nice for me to keep them in a container so that so that uh, I can enjoy the beautiful flowers and and I can move it around and uh, really highlight it when it's looking its best. But really easy to grow. That's Amazon lily or Eucharist lily.
Um, I love this one. This this I have over by my driveway. It's called the blackberry lily or bellum canda. Um, and it's there's only one uh, species of bellum canda, that's chinensis, but there are numerous cultivar selections. Um, the one I have is this orange one. There are yellow forms. There are taller ones. There are shorter ones, but they've got that that really distinct iris-like foliage, um, and they bloom freely uh, through uh, throughout the warm weather. They will uh, set seeds that kind of look a lot like a blackberry. So they've got the clusters of, of black seeds, and they that's where it gets its common name, blackberry lily. And they germinate readily, and it's uh, an easy one to share with other folks that you want. So uh, germinate some blackberry lilies, and you'll you'll be loved by your neighbors in your uh, in your garden space. I love the blood lily. Uh, blood lilies to me, they look like an erector set. And before the uh, the leaves come up, or about the same time the leaves are coming up, it comes up with these beautiful uh, red blooms that are about four inches across, and uh, they just are. It's almost like a, a firework went off. Um, so really pretty. And these do best in the shade. So maybe underneath a, a tree might be great for these. They benefit greatly from nice organic soils, or they can make a great container plant. Again, they do go dormant in the wintertime. You want to make sure not to pitch that pot if, if it uh, did have a blood lily bulb in it. Uh, you want to make sure not to throw that away when it's dormant in the wintertime. Caladiums, uh, University of Florida has a, a very um, strong caladium breeding program. Uh, and it uh, we have new varieties coming out all the time. And many of, there are ones that are best in the shade. And then there are many now that uh, are bred to do well in the sun. When I was growing up, uh, caladiums were, I always thought of it, uh, a bulb for the shade but there are ones that will love the sun now. And you'll see reds and you'll see pinks and you'll see whites in combinations of those. And sometimes you'll see these heart-shaped leaves and sometimes you'll see more arrow-shaped leaves. So a lot of different caladiums. In the springtime, all the garden centers will have the bulbs that you can purchase. Um, they come up reliably each and every year. Um, if they're in an area that has very little organic matter, it's just not a... Uh, great conditions for them. You will probably see them get smaller uh, year after year. Um, you know, they'll be there for quite some time, but in in good soils and uh, if they're cared for well, you'll see them continue to multiply and come back for uh, years to come. And so it really is an easy plant and can give you that spot of color, that real shot of color to, to get everybody excited about your landscape. Calla lilies, a lot of people don't realize that we can grow calla lilies throughout the state of Florida. A lot of different colors and a lot of different sizes too. Um, some of the callas get very large. You know, we're talking about a plant that gets uh, two to two and a half feet tall and, and huge blooms um, and, you know, maybe four to six inches. Um, so, you know, really large blooms. Um, and some of them have speckles to the foliage they're really an easy plant. They'll do best where they get morning sun, maybe a little protection from afternoon, that hot afternoon sun. But if you haven't grown callas, give them a try. Cannas have been popular for a long time and uh, very easy to grow. They multiply quickly. Again, one you can share. Um, they have can have very colorful foliage or colorful blooms or both. Um, sometimes I, some of these uh, blooms take away from the colorful foliage. So um, it really is kind of a balancing act, but uh, you can pick and choose a wide range um, colors from, you know, pinks and reds and oranges. Um, so, you know, a lot of different shades. And so look to see what, what works, what uh, combinations work best in your landscape and with the rest of your plants. Um, Probably the biggest pest problem we have with these is the canna leaf roller. Um, and, you know, we can control that with, you know, some some of the pesticides like uh, BT um, can can help with some of those problems. 
Uh, but uh, it's not one I have a lot of problems with. And so it's it's an easy plant in my landscape and very few problems. Um, there's the crinodonna lily or amacrinum. Um, amacrinum is a bigeneric cross between amaryllis and crinum. And so these, uh, you'll see with a lot of bulbs, they'll, they'll uh, cross different genera together and you can get some, some interesting mixes. And uh, this is one that I had in my landscape I've had for, oh, probably at least 17, 18 years. And it flowers reliably and just a beautiful plant. Um, again, it's got foliage, you know, kind, kind of similar to a crinum, small, smaller crinum lily, um, but beautiful blooms in the springtime. So amacrinum. And then we'll move right into the crinum lilies. And I love crinum lilies. And this is a group of plants that I think makes a great collection um, because there's, uh, they're easy to grow, wide range of, of sizes and colors. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things you might have to hunt for a little bit to find the different varieties, but a lot of people are willing to share them as well. So here you can see just some of the the more familiar ones that you might see. Um, there you see on the right, the milk and wine. And um, we'll look at uh, some of the larger crinums, um, like the crinum Americana. And it, it gets it gets big. You'll look at every bit of five, six feet tall and beautiful white blooms. And there's red forms of this. Um, and this one uh, on the left you see in my landscape, that'll be that's that bloom at the top is every bit of eight feet tall. Um, and that plant is at least 10 feet across. Um, it's a big plant um, and it survives our winters here in, in Gainesville very well. I don't do any protection to it. Uh, when we have those really cold temperatures, the leaves kind of melt off and I do have to, to prune it and clean it up. But uh, I've really never had it uh, freeze all the way back uh, to the bulb. Um, but uh, the blooms are very fragrant. Um, it really is a wonderful plant and it makes a huge statement in the landscape. But it can't. some of them can get big like this one and it'll need some space. Some other crinums. Uh, there on the left you see one of my favorites. It's one called Shrek. Um, and uh, it's a great bloomer. I'll see it bloom at least four to five times during the year. Uh, that one in the middle uh, on uh, the top there, that's one that I bought oh, five, six years ago. It's one called Peach Blow. Um, and um, it's bloomed at least six times this year and is uh, very fragrant. The one below it, the white one below it, is one called Little Stinker. Um, it's got a little lighter fragrance. It's not as fragrant to, actually as Peach Blow, but um, it's a fun little name to it. Uh, and it's it's bloomed reliably as well. So a lot of different types, just start looking and you'll you'll see a wide range of blooming seasons, of uh, size plant, as, as well as bloom size. So it uh, th they're fun, but they're tough and durable and survivors in the landscape. A great one is Crocosmia. Um, when I grew up, this is one that I grew up knowing as uh, Mont Brescia, but uh, Crocosmia is one that I have mixed success with. Um, I don't get a lot of flowers, near the flowers that uh, I would hope to get um, on mine. But, uh, you know, I have a bed that's probably six feet by three feet. And, you know, I get sporadic blooms through that. And it's a pretty easy plant. I don't do anything to it. I don't do a lot of care. Um, probably if I fertilized, I'd get more blooms. Um, but uh, they can be orangey or red and can be stunningly beautiful. So that's Crocosmia. Some of the Narcissus are just fantastic. Now, we don't think of Florida as being Narcissus country. Um, you know, when we're talking about Narcissus, we're thinking about those daffodils that are out there. And uh, these are ones that are in my landscape that flower reliably every year. Um, not necessarily as large as some of those that you'll see further north, um, and, and maybe not as many blooms as we might see further north. But there are narcissus that will do well from central Florida north. So um, that's something to look for. And 
there uh, there used to be the Florida Daffodil Society, and um, I believe they disbanded maybe in 2018. But there, um, some of their newsletters are still up online. So uh, if you're looking for varieties for Florida, that that's where I would uh, be looking for. And you know, there's a, a there's a list of recommended varieties for Florida. Um, some of our extension offices have uh, demonstrations as well, demonstration plantings of Narcissus. So check with your local county extension office and um, get those varieties that are performing well. Uh, don't just order anything uh, or you might be disappointed. Dahlias, you know, you don't think of Florida as dahlia country, but you know, if dahlias can perform very well in Florida, um, it just takes uh, really good soil uh, for them to, to perform well. And then uh, a little bit of care from time to time. Biggest thing is going to be the key is going to be getting lots of organic matter, keeping that soil rich um, and your, uh, your dahlias can really perform well here, much like they do up north. So um, they make a great cut flower. Um, and they come in these wicked shades uh, that just really attract your attention. So, um, you know, if you've tried and failed, um, try try working harder on your soil. Uh, maybe even consider growing them in containers where you have complete control over that that soil. Daylilies. Where would our landscapes be without daylilies? Um, they're just beautiful, and you know they're they're edible. The petals are edible as well. Um, which is kind of fun, although I'm not too big into eating the flowers from my garden, um, but uh, I, I'd rather look at them than eat them. But uh, daylilies are just a, a wonderful plant. They're listed as very being very drought tolerant. However, they perform best where they have good organic soils with a, a good level of moisture, and that's uh, where they'll really perform. There are singles, there's doubles, there's large ones, there's small ones, there's tall ones, there's short ones too. A lot of different day lilies to add to your landscape. And so it is one that uh, it is best. There are there are evergreen types, there are semi-deciduous, and then there are deciduous ones. Those deciduous ones go completely dormant and come back in the spring with new foliage. Um, there is one big pest problem that showed up, oh, probably 25 years ago. Um, and that, that's daylily rust. And so we plant varieties that for best success, you wanna plant varieties that are resistant to daylily rust. And that way it doesn't become a real problem. University of Florida has some great publications and we'll list those varieties that are most resistant to the rust. Um, and then uh, it'll list out other varieties that uh, may, may have to, to be treated if you really want those varieties. Um, some of them have real um, textured like petals, real thick petals, um, where others may be thinner um, and, um, you know, just a wide range of colors. And some of them will really, some of those hybrid ones you see will just really knock your socks off. They, they can be quite gorgeous. So think about adding daylilies to your landscape. How about those elephant ears? Um, you know, there's a wide range of them. And normally there are uh, three main genera that we uh, think of the elephant ears, alocasia, colocasia, and xanthosoma. Now the, the big elephant ears, I see bulbs sold uh, all the time. That's colocasia esculenta. Um, and that is an invasive plant and one that we really don't want to see planted uh, in our landscapes. So in a lot of the colocasias, if you want to be safe, maybe stay away from the colocasias a little bit and plant the alocasias or the xantha, xanthosomas. Um, they may be less of an issue with in, invasivity. But certainly a lot of new varieties, a lot of cultivar selections, wide range of colors and sizes. Um, so, you know, these are relatively easy to grow. Um, most, many of them, I won't say all, many of them will come back from their bulbous-like structure um, even, even after going through some freezing temperatures. So a lot of times in my landscape, I'll see them go dormant and then uh, come back um, after uh, the soil warms in the spring. So pretty easy. 
uh, give them a try and, and see which ones you like the best. Fun little bulb I have in my landscape called Eucrosia, and I don't know a common name for this one, but uh, it'll have this rosette of, oh, about eight to nine inch uh, long leaves and makes a great little basal rosette. And in the spring, it comes up with these kind of odd shaped flowers. And it really can be striking, very easy. The only pest problem I've had is the lubber grasshoppers do love this one. It's one of the first things they'll go to. So, but it really is an easy one and has performed well year after year for me. Gingers, a wide range of gingers. We'll start first with the alpinias or shell type gingers um, and shell or torch type gingers. You'll see these and um, common landscape plants. Uh, they perform very well. Um, even you'll see them used quite a bit even in north florida um, but uh, central and south florida they don't get as damaged in the winter time and so um it can really be stunning additions to the landscape um and it just gives that tropical feel um they'll take some of them do better with a little bit of shade um where others can uh take a little more sun but uh, shell gingers are are very impactful in the landscape then we've got the curcumas or hidden gingers. And this uh, the, the use of these has proliferated quite a bit uh, in recent years. And you'll see these um, ones like you see on the left here, um, the cyan tulip, they're sometimes called um, because they kind of have that. We don't do well with tulips, but uh, you know, the uh, you know, these kind of have that tulip look and they come in wide range of colors, as you can see um, from, you know, whites to uh, to fuchsias to reds. Um, and so a lot of different curcumas that uh, can do well in the landscape and they come back year after year. Most of them do best with some shade. However, I've seen a planting this year for the first time out in full sun uh, and they were surviving that full hot sun uh, in the adjacent to a roadway in a shopping center. And, you know, I, I have to say that uh, they, they performed quite well. So maybe they'll take a little bit more sun than, than I'm comfortable with. But I usually keep mine in a little bit more shade. And then there's the spiral gingers or costas. And uh, again, wide range of colors and sizes and bloom structures, um, but costas do quite well. I have a number of, quite a few in my landscape. They freeze in the winter time, they come right back. Uh, and uh, once they get a little size to them again, they begin flowering again. So um, costas are another group of gingers that you can have. And then there's the globas or dancing ladies. These, these individual blooms, uh, supposedly look a little bit like a ballerina and i guess i can see that um, but uh, again different colors and these are small probably 18 to 24 inch plants and then these bloom structures hang down and uh, the, many of them will produce these little bulbils that'll drop and you'll you'll have lots of different globas in your landscape and then there's the butterfly gingers or the hedicums and uh, there on the left, you see the white butterfly ginger. Uh, on the right, you see one, one of my favorites called Dr. Moy. Um, these are very fragrant. Um, and, uh, you know, you just love to have fragrant plants in the landscape. And, and this is one, if, if you enjoy having that fragrance, uh, it's one that certainly uh, have some butterfly gingers. And again, wide range of them, different uh, growth habits. Some are variegated, some have green leaves. Um, just look to see what you can find and see the, the different butterfly gingers. And then there's a wide range of other gingers that you can have from the peacock gingers you see at that lower right to the pine cone gingers you see in the upper left and, and top middle. Um, and uh, I love this, this little uh, ginger on the, on the left. Um, that's Campharia uh, rotunda. And uh, it has these, you know, what people have described to me as orchid-like blooms that come up before the foliage does, and just these sit right on top of the mulch. Um, really beautiful. So 
a um, lot of different uh, gingers. It's a great group of plants to, to think about. Most of them probably prefer a little bit of shade, especially these peacock gingers. Uh, they'll We normally think of gingers being a little more shade loving um, as opposed to being in the sun. Gladiolas, um, I think very underutilized plant. Um, these perform very well in sunny locations. They, they do best in the sun and the colors can just knock your socks off. And uh, they may take a little bit of staking. You'll see I stake mine up as they, as they flower, um, but uh, the, the blooms are really beautiful. They make a great cut flower as well that can last for a week or more in a vase in the house. And then there's the little, uh, what, what I grew up knowing as mini glad. And uh, these are anamathecas, and uh, there is a white one, and then there's uh, this kind of, uh, I'll call it pinkish uh, one, and really gorgeous. These are small plants. These are only six inches tall, um, and those individual blooms are maybe about an inch across, but they flower reliably. They set a lot of seeds, so your bed grows and your collection of them uh, will continue to grow. And so you'll be able to share these again with uh, with friends because they just uh, proliferate quite a bit. But beautiful blooms on these. One of the, one of the ones I, I grew up loving was Gloriosa Lily. And it's one that I want to, I'm showing it to you today to tell you probably not to grow this one. Uh, it has these very exotic blooms. Uh, it's uh, it's a vining type plant. It needs some uh, some sort of structure to hang on to, but it is one that has been listed by the UFIFIS assessment as being high invasion risk. So I encourage you to, to avoid planting this one. Um, it looks exotic in the catalogs and everything, but um, this is one we probably should take a pass on. And then there's Hymenocallus. Uh, this is a variegated one that you see uh, the foliage on on the, the left, but most of them will be all green. Um, but uh, the the bloom structures are, are beautiful, usually this white color um, and kind of spidery uh, in appearance. Very low maintenance, very easy plant to grow, and it flowers freely each year. African iris, um, terrific plant. Um, in time, uh, these uh, the foliage of the African iris can get oh probably three three plus feet tall maybe three three and a half feet tall um, and then you'll get these beautiful blooms like you see on the left and then there's uh, Dietes bicolor that you see on the right um, that yellowish one um, the foliage is a little um, uh, say a little softer on that one and again beautiful um, yellow blooms on that one. Maybe maybe that one's about three feet or less. And then you have the walking iris um, and uh, the uh, giant walking iris that you see on the left or apostle iris. Um, that one has gotten very popular uh, in recent years, especially central Florida south. Um, in north Florida, it does need protection um, or it'll get knocked back. Um, but uh, you'll find different walking iris. Uh, some of them are in the genus Neomerica, while others are Trimesia, like you see there on the right. Um, they come in different colors. They get their name walking iris because many of them, um, the, uh, the, the blooms will kind of lay down and root, and uh, the plants just continue to walk and proliferate that way. Um, so old tiny plants uh, that have been shared for years and years. The kafer lily or clivia, to me, this is, you know, one of those Cadillac of plants. And, you know, you have these beautiful, this beautiful strappy foliage and these incredible blooms in the springtime. Usually you see the orange or sometimes an orange and yellow mix. And then there, there are the, the yellow forms as well. Um, there's there are nurseries dedicated to to growing clivia, 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 um, and they the, the hybrids are are absolutely stunning. So you can spend a lot of money on these, um, but uh, they they're very easy to care for. 
Um, I keep, uh, I have some in the ground that I do have to protect here in North Florida. So I'll throw a blanket over them on freezing nights, um, but they, they flower and perform well for me. Um, I have grown them from seed. Um, and so you never quite know what you're gonna get when you grow from seed. Um, and uh, they do, you can divide them as well um, because they will continue to multiply. But kefir lily is a great one to add to your collections. Some people even grow them as uh, interior foliage plants. Oxblood lily, kind of a little known um, bulb that uh, is one that um, flowers in late spring, early summer, um, has these red blooms, and it's a great one, they say, for naturalizing. Um, it has, might have done well. There's also a pink form uh, that's less common. I have I paid a good bit of money for my pink one, um, but uh, it uh, they flower quite well. The other pest problem that I didn't talk about sometimes are our deer will come and and chew the uh, blooms on these. They don't eat the foliage much, but they do chew chew the blooms sometimes. So sometimes I have to share some of my bulbs with the deer, unfortunately. And then there's rain lilies. I love rain lilies, and usually they're going to be. Uh, in the genera Zephyranthes or Habranthes. Um, Zephyranthes are typically going to be ones that have their bloom facing straight up and will have one flower to uh, the stem. And then the Habranthes will kind of have more that um, that nodding flower and may have two to three flowers per stem. Um, now, rain lilies, like the name kind of implies, um, they tend to flower following a rainstorm. Um, now you can irrigate them and uh, they may flower a little bit with irrigation, but uh, they flower much better after rain. And uh, uh, I've never quite understood um, exactly what that combination or what the, the trigger mechanism is. Um, but, uh, you know, rain is, is something that really will make these things bloom. There's a lot of hybrids. Traditionally, we would think of them being pink or, or whitish pink. Um, and now you see ones that uh, have incredible color like the orange you see in, uh, on the right. Um, both of these are in my landscape and, and perform very well. And then there's Scylla. Um, Scylla is one on the right. Um, that's Scylla peruviana. Um, it's one that blooms for me about every four or five years. Um, it really takes a, a cool fall um, for it to then flower in the springtime. And, you know, it's a bulb that probably would do better further north where it gets more chill, more reliable chill time. And then there's one that I just added to my collection last year on the left there. That's uh, Scylla madrensis. And Scylla madrensis is more tropical. Um, and so I'll have to protect it from uh, freezing weather. I keep it in a container. Um, and there you see the beautiful blooms on it. Um, so um, Scylla madrensis more for tropical parts and Scylla peruviana probably north Florida or beyond or, or further north. And then there's society garlic, an old time uh, ground cover that uh, is tough as nails, very drought tolerant, very durable. It does, if you handle it at all or disturb it at all, it does have uh, a garlic scent to uh, to that foliage. Um, but uh, th there is a white form and, and even a variegated one that I've seen, um, not very often, but occasionally you'll see it offered in some, some of the catalogs. But most of them, a time you'll see this lavender uh, bloom. And again, it, it's very drought tolerant. It's a survivor. Um, it just continues to flower its head off. So uh, a good one. Here I'm using it in front of uh, Princess Caroline uh, Penicetum uh, that I have in my landscape. And then there's the surprise lilies or Lycoris. And these are ones also known as hurricane lilies because they're coming up and flowering in September typically. Uh, during hurricane season, and they'll pop up out of the ground with with just the blooms, and then it's followed by the foliage, uh, which will come up afterwards, and it'll persist with the foliage all through the wintertime, 
and the foliage goes dormant in them in the spring. So they're dormant during the summer as opposed to the winter. A little different, a little backwards from most of our other bulbs that we talk about. But uh, the hurricane lilies are, are certainly fun. Uh, the one in the upper right, that's Lycoris aurea. Uh, there on the left, top left, that's uh, Lycoris radiata. Um, and uh, the one lower right, that's a cultivar co selection called dynamite. Um, and then Alba is on the left. Um, so a wide range of colors. Um, they're pretty easy. They don't take a lot of care. Um, you want to make sure you're getting the ones, though, best suited for um, our conditions, for our zones. And then there's the toad lily, uh, probably best in North Florida, um, not so much probably Central Florida um, or South Florida, but uh, toad lilies are, you know, they're, it's a plant that'll grow to about 18 to 24 inches, and it gets, opens up with these uh, beautiful blooms um, in late summer, early fall, and uh, really stunning. Um, and they've performed very well for me and uh, with very little care. So toad lily. And then there's trillium. This is one that uh, it's been in my landscape for 20 years, and it's still not very big. Um, so very slow growing, probably best for North Florida or further north. Um, but uh, you might find some trillium that go into to central Florida, but that would probably be its limit. Uh, they come up in the springtime with uh, this, you know, three lobed leaf, and then it then you'll see the blooms uh, on top of it, usually kind of in, in the purples. Further north, in areas further north, you might see yellows and whites, um, but uh, here this is what you'll typically see in North Florida. And then there's the voodoo lily. I love the voodoo lilies. Um, we're talking about Amorpha phallus. And there on the left, you see Amorpha phallus paeonifolius. Um, and that one will get quite large. Um, the, the bulb will get about the size of a bowling ball. And that plant will get every bit of five foot tall. And you see the bloom there in the, the, the center. Um, and most of the Amorpha phallus, the blooms have a, a very foul smell um, and smells a lot like rotting meat. Um, and so, you know, you think of the, the world's largest flower um, and that's Amorpha phallus titanum. That's a tropical Amorpha phallus, one that would have to be grown in a greenhouse setting. Um, but uh, it's, it's one certainly I don't have in my collection. Um, but uh, on the right-hand side, that's one called Amorpha phallus cusianus. And uh, Amorpha phallus cusianus has a white flower, and then it gets these metallic colored seed pods that... Uh, um, start out pink and end up going blue and it's stunningly beautiful um, and you know interesting group of plants um, they only smell for a couple of days so you know it's not something to freak out too much about but uh, just know that uh, it most of them do have uh, kind of an unpleasant smell to the blooms and then there's bulbs for forcing you know you talk People that come from somewhere else, we talked about that you you love your tulips, you love your hyacinths. Um, you can still grow those, uh, even though you're here in Florida. Even though we don't have the cool weather for them, you can. Probably the best way to go about doing this is you, you take your bulbs, you pot them uh, into the container you want. You put that entire container uh, into the refrigerator, um, ideally probably in a paper bag or something. Um, and you'll refrigerate them probably for eight to 12 weeks. And then you'll take them out and they'll come up and bloom for you. Um, and then we'll throw them away um, because they typically will not take forcing more than once. So it's one of those things, if you have to have your tulips or you have to have hyacinth, go ahead and give them a try. Um, to me, it's not worth my effort for the little bit of bloom that I will get for them. Um, I'll go up north and visit places where I can see them thriving. Um, I am not going to try and do that here. And we'll finish up uh, today talking about resources. Where do you get your information? 
Um, well, here's a few spots for some information. There's uh, the Gardening Solutions page, and you'll see the website there, gardeningsolutions.ifis.ufl.edu. A um, lot of good information there on different bulbs. Um, there's the Ask IFIS site, which is edis.ifis.ufl.edu, and there are some fact sheets out there. There was an old fact sheet that's no longer in print uh, that was called Bulbs for Florida. And it was a tremendous document that you can still find um, on um, some of the library sites still have copies of, of that that you can access. And it's pretty much a comprehensive document on uh, different bulbs for growing in Florida. Um, so it's, it's one that uh, if you can get your hands on it, it's a, a good one. Um, the book Garden Bulbs for the South is one that I've enjoyed reading and and having on, on my bookshelf, um, it's uh, by Scott Ogden and uh, is a great resource. And don't forget your extension office. Your local extension offices have great information. So if you have questions, uh, go there and find out from them what, uh, you, know, what you like, um, what you may want to try and grow, and they'll probably be able to help you. And then there's our societies. And, you know, there's Daylily Societies, Amaryllis Societies. As I mentioned, there used to be uh, a Daffodil Society in Florida. A lot of different groups that you can get great information. You can get, uh, get plants to share, plants to add to your collection, um, and, you know, just um, explore this magical world of bulbs. So think about adding some color and variety to your landscape. Here you can see a, a picture of some of the amaryllis blooming in my landscape just last year. Um, and you can see the number of blooms. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. And as I say, they can make have a huge yes, impact. Yes, yeah. So um, with that, um, Jen, I will uh, open it up for questions and see if there's uh, anything I could add. Great. Um, thank you, Tom. That was wonderful. Um, I do have some, uh, I have a bunch of questions actually. So uh, let's see. Um, let's see, what did we start? We started at 1230 here. So we'll, we'll go for like 15 minutes uh, and I'll get as many questions as I can to you. Um, what do you think about bulbs and wax? You know, sometimes we'll see amaryllis in that are coated in wax. Um, and, you know, they make a, a great little uh, novelty that can, you can set on, on your desk or on, on a piece of furniture and the bloom will continue to, to grow and flower. Um, probably very stressful on that bulb. Um, so it may, if it does survive afterwards, if you take that wax off after it finishes blooming, uh, it may or may not survive. It just uh, probably was stressed out. So it's one of those things, it's a great gift. It's a fun thing to do. Probably not the best for the bulb, however. Okay. Uh, someone asked if you could share um, the growing zones for these plants. I don't know if uh, maybe um, we could many, put out a list or, or... Many of these will go throughout the state. You know, okay. certainly the gingers are going to go throughout the state, the calla lily throughout the state, amaryllis, you know, certainly throughout the state. Some of those that were more North Florida were like the the toad lily and the trillium. Um, you, you know, you're kind of kind of looking at really just uh, in North Florida. But most of these um, that I showed today will pretty much do throughout the state of Florida. Okay. Uh, why do I get rust spots on my canas? They they can get some uh, some can of rust. Uh, there are fungicides you can use for that. Um, ideally try and avoid, um, you know, keeping, keeping them moist at night, you know, only water in the early morning hours, make sure they have good air movement where you have good air movement. You'll have, uh, fewer, uh, problems with rust, um, and some varieties may be more prone than others. So, um, another option would be to choose some different varieties. Rust is not a terribly difficult, um, fungus to control so pretty easily controlled with some of the uh the fungicides that you can get so just make sure you get something that's labeled for 
uh, for that landscape use and, and labeled for using on uh, cannas. All right. Uh, do bulbs attract pollinators? Some will, certainly. Um, you know, many of them have tubular shaped blooms that that might attract um, hummingbirds um, as well as uh, some butterflies. But, you know, whenever you have a flower, you know, you've got something that uh, uh, typically is going to be pollinated by one thing or another. We'll even go to the voodoo lilies that are pollinated by flies. That's why they smell bad. Um, they smell like rotting meat because they want to attract flies because the flies are the pollinator for that. So um, I, I assume when people are talking about attracting pollinators, they're thinking bees and butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, so most anything that, you know, especially anything that's going to smell sweet or uh, will, it's going to get some pollinator going to it. Great. Um, I have one. I, I believe this gentleman or this uh, lady meant salt tolerant, but uh, are any bulbs salt tolerant? I'm sure they are. I've, I've been a central Florida guy my entire um, horticulture career, so I haven't mm -hmm. been um, to, to the, uh, I haven't landscaped a lot on the coasts. Um, I, you know, I know that uh, I've seen crinum lilies be be used on mm -hmm. the coast area, but I haven't seen them, you know, in direct salt spray. I, I don't think they would tolerate it, um, direct salt spray, but, you know, certainly they could be used in some of those coastal areas. Um, biggest thing would be to try some of these. Gingers, certainly, uh, again, they're not going to tolerate direct salt spray. Um, I don't know of any any of the bulbs that would tolerate direct salt spray. Okay. And I have used crinum lilies before, uh, you know, along the coast, but not, uh, again, not in direct salt, salt spray. But uh, um, let's see, the four to five foot crinum Asiatic uh, is confused with the crinum Americana, which is the wetlands plant. Correct, actually. And I, I misspoke when I said that uh, crinum Americana is is smaller and, and it is a wetlands plant. And um Good call. Thank you for for correcting me on that. Uh, um, the Asiaticum is the the larger one. Correct. Great. Uh, let's see here. Another question about which bulbs are most salt air tolerant. So that that may be a a crinum. Um, having a problem with burnt tips on agapanthus, even those with just morning sun. Burnt tips um, could be a lack of moisture. Um, you know, biggest thing is going to be to make sure that they're they're getting enough moisture, uh, especially during the springtime. We we can be hot and dry, um, and so that that might be the issue. Um, that's that's you know, unless they're just in beating down sun, that would be the thing I would think about most uh, is check your water. Great. Um, what ginger can we grow that is like the root we use in cooking? Well, we can grow edible ginger. It just doesn't have as attractive a bloom. And to my knowledge, um, everything that I've, I've ever read, um, all gingers are edible. However, most of them don't taste very good. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's the the edible ginger you you'll find that at some of the garden centers some of the local garden centers will sell the edible ginger it just doesn't have uh, as showy a bloom as some of the others and so um it's not one that uh, people grow for uh for the color and and for the landscape value as much as they do just to be able to consume it so um it certainly is one that will thrive and do well here all right uh, are the peacock gingers evergreen in South Florida? Mine go dormant in Jacksonville, the comment says. You know, I, I know that they go dormant um, even down in Central Florida. I would assume that they go dormant even in South Florida. So I think they need that break. Um, right. And I don't think it's just temperature related. I think it's day length has something to do with their um you know, when they go dormant as well. So as we start, as the days start getting 
shorter and the nights are getting longer, um, I, I think they'll go dormant anyway, even down in South Florida. Okay. Uh, are lubbers a problem for costas? For uh, hostas? hostas? Yeah. Cost yeah. Costas? We don't grow a lot of hostas. Are no, you co a co maybe I'm saying it wrong. Costas. C O S T U S. Okay. I've never had them chew my my um, costas at all. Um, I've never seen any damage. So, to my knowledge, no. Um, but I have enough other things that they love. Um, so, <laughs> could they eat them? Probably. I've seen them eat my cycads. I've seen them eat a wide range of plant material, uh, but it's not something I've ever observed. All right. Uh, what uh, lilies are Florida natives? You know, there are some crinums that are that are Florida natives. There's uh, some of the rain lilies are native to to Florida as well. Um, trying to think of there's some there's a native canna. Um, there's uh, native iris um, that we can grow. Our blue flag iris um, certainly are are excellent. Um, just trying to go down down the one, list and think. One, um, so I'm sorry. One comment since it says Zephyranthius. Yeah, the rain rain lilies. Okay, uh, certainly, and probably those of those. There definitely are native selections of all of those. Okay. Um. Here's okay. Can can hosta grow in Central Florida? You know there are some hostas that people try and grow. Um. There's, there's even one called sun hosta um, that I've tried. Um, you know, they'll hang on for a number of years and grow. Um, they don't thrive. They don't look anything like the hostas do further north. So Florida really is not hosta country. I would stay away from hosta um, and plant something that will do better here. Um, the peacock gingers are a nice substitute for hostas, certainly. Okay. Is the Adamasco lily the same as rain lily? The which? Adamasco, A-T-A-M-A-S-C-O. I don't know that one, so I okay. honestly don't know. Uh, let's see. Um, what low ground covers work with bulbs that go dormant? Can you use frog fruit with bulbs to keep we keep down the weeds? You know, I've never thought of interplanting um, my bulbs with frog fruit, but I don't see why it wouldn't. Uh, I think a lot of things could uh, coexist with it. So um, sure, give it a try. Um, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. Right. Uh, Great idea. That. Um, let's see. My caladium seemed to disappear. What is happening? If they're just disappearing, my gut says something dug it up. Maybe, maybe armadillos or something that were after uh, insects, mm -hmm. perhaps in the soil. Um, you know, normally, you know, as I said, if the if the soil's not good and and conditions aren't the best, we will see them slowly decline. So you know where it's might be you know eighteen inches across the first year, and the next year it may only be twelve inches across, and the next year it might be nine inches across. You know, so we may see them slowly decline. We don't see them disappear typically unless something um affected that bulb directly either something took the bulb ate the bulb or or if it was overly wet site i could see the bulbs rotting um i can't see anything else really happening though someone just commented that moles eat my caladiums so maybe uh it's uh, mol moles could certainly do that but they're they're not trying to eat your caladiums they're, they're normally feeding on insects and and they might come into contact with them and, and damage them that way. Okay. Uh, just a couple more here. Um, what month do you plant daffodil bulbs? Um, typically you're going to be planting, I'm trying to think when they're available. Um, normally you're, you're planting them in the 
fall and winter for spring blooms. So, um, you know, if you wanted to plant them now, that's that's a great time. Okay. Um, let's see. Can he supply a list of all the bulbs he presented today? I took notes, but would appreciate spelling. Uh, well, we uh, this this uh, webinar is um, taped and will be available on our website, floridafriendlylandscaping.com, um, within probably two weeks. Uh, and you can go back through and um, you know watch it again for for the spelling and uh, for the pictures. Um, Let's see, I believe that might be, that might be it, Tom. Um, thank you so much for, for uh, joining me for my last uh, webinar of the year. Um, it was a, a very successful one. Um, and uh, we hoped that, uh, you know, Tom does, of course, a, a webinar as well for our program. And uh, we hope that we see all of you um, next year. Tom, I guess you have one more left, but... Uh, I hope I see all of you next year uh, in January uh, for our um, next series. So uh, everybody have a great day and um, stay safe. Thanks. Thanks, Jen.